Our story begins a long time ago, when our protagonist couldn't have imagined that there would be a future like the one that was about to unfold before his eyes. As if it wasn't enough that he had to return to school just when he had reached that age, he suddenly had to face a new challenge in his life that was almost as daunting as his studies, facing huge, menacing monsters. But not only that, because not only did our protagonist start having to face huge monsters like those using his bare hands wielding a sword, but he also ended up finding friends like those he never thought he would one day have, which only allowed him to no longer be alone in that world. But leaving that aside, our protagonist was also having to face the one who was the original protagonist of that story, Taylor McClure, who was always taking on the role of saving people in danger and also doing all the things you'd expect from an ordinary protagonist in stories like that. But meanwhile, our manual protagonist, Ed Roth Taylor, was just a third-rate villain within that story rather than the protagonist of that work. As they crossed powers, Ed thought that originally, he was supposed to be nothing more than a nobody who wouldn't appear much in the main story and would just be another stepping stone used by the protagonist to ascend in his life, but even third-rate characters like villains had their own unique ways of acting, and so he himself didn't need anyone's understanding to understand what he wanted by taking those actions as an antagonist. Especially when that was totally impossible for the protagonist, but in any case, it was all for the best and for the sake of the end of that story in which several events and characters would be involved, his actions would have far greater consequences in the future. And for that, Ed needed to survive and avoid his own death for the sake of the story, and that was his biggest and greatest goal. The scene then cuts to the past, where we meet the protagonist of our manhwa, Ed Rothtaler. He was the ruffian son of a high-society noble family who ruled over the academy like a king, but now his life was turned upside down when he receives a message about how they were basically removing him from the family register under the sin of reckless profanity in the presence of the Honorable Princess Phonia. The sin of intruding into the great and sacred Sylvania Academy during the entrance exam, and also under the sin of lacking any and all decency and manners, as well as sinning by using the Roth Taylor family name through his jealousy and envy, all those sins committed by Ed would not be dealt with simply, and now the protagonist would be dealing with the consequences of his actions openly. When he saw this, Ed commented that it only seemed as if the god of fate was mocking him especially since that message only meant that his previous life was completely over. As a result, he was kicked out of the place where he used to live and had all his things thrown out without any delicacy or care, and even as he walked alone through the streets, people commented on the famous Ed Roth Taylor in a low voice to avoid him overhearing them gossiping about his life, but still everyone commented on how there was no reason for them to worry about Ed overhearing what they were saying about him, not after he had apparently been disowned by his own family, to the point of being kicked out of his own dorm room, causing the students to scoff about how they possibly wouldn't even have to see his face next semester given that he was practically being kicked out of school, especially since Ed hadn't even been able to take the entrance exam properly to begin with, and so it was ridiculous to even consider that he would stay at the school. Everyone kept gossiping about how the protagonist was just a member of the nobility who wasted his title and time acting like that. But the protagonist just thought that honestly it just seemed rather unfair on his side because the great and arrogant Ed Roth Taylor was only seen that way now that people were commenting on his problems in an absurd way, especially since the old Ed wasn't even the protagonist who was currently in his body, and the consequences of the actions of the original owner of the body were being put on his back. The truth was that our protagonist ended up inside a game, which was nothing more than a basic game with a magic school called Sylvania Academy, and it was his favorite game known as the Flawed Swordsman of Sylvania. Normally, when someone went inside manga or comics to get stuck in, they would be the first son of some kind of super awesome rich family, a middle-class genius who ended up becoming a grand master, or even as a generic SSS rank hunter character or something like that. But of all the possibilities presented, the protagonist had the worst luck in the world in being trapped inside the body of a third-rate villain who ended up being kicked out of the dorms right at the start of the game, Ed Rothtaler.
In other words, the protagonist managed to have the great fortune of possessing the worst kind of character at the worst possible moment in the game, which only makes the protagonist complain to God and the world about how totally unfair it was for him. After all, he's always had a simple and totally straightforward life without any extra requests to make of the world, and what he gets in return is that kind of treatment from the new world he's been sent to. But as Ed says those things out loud the people around him start laughing in his face because suddenly he starts saying those things shouting for everyone to hear how unfair the things he was going through were even after everything he'd done. In other words, everyone was making fun of him because after all, he was just suffering the penalty for his actions, even though the protagonist himself had nothing to do with the actions of Ed's character from before. People don't just laugh at him, they start calling him a piece of garbage with no shame whatsoever for his actions, clearly learning nothing from what he had done and his punishment, something that only makes the protagonist sigh and give up complaining to the world about his circumstances. But even worse than getting into Ed's body was that his status window was actually complete crap, which just made everything a thousand times worse in several different ways. He looks at Ed's character statuses totally outraged because normally even an ordinary NPC would have 5 stamina, but he managed to be bad even at that because his stamina was only 3 points. What's more, Ed was attending the Magic Academy, but even so his intellect was completely on the floor, and on top of that his stamina was beyond the adjective of low, it was ridiculous even for a person who wasn't of the nobility. But that shouldn't have come as a surprise because originally Ed was just a third-rate villain who appeared in specific places to annoy the protagonists and then disappeared as if nothing had happened, and to make matters worse even the protagonist barely remembered the official appearances he made and couldn't even remember what happened to him after his generic appearances with the protagonists taking action and giving him a good lecture. But as soon as he thinks about it, the protagonist remembers that during the game's credits Ed practically appeared as a poor old drunk turned into a ridiculous beggar, who only appeared to make the players happy to see a villain like him suffering from his own actions, which was no surprise because for a ruffian who had lived his whole life without knowing anything about that world and was suddenly put out on the streets like that overnight, it was just great luck that he had even survived that far but still to have an end like that by turning into a rotten, poor beggar was quite humiliating even for him. With a sigh, Ed reflected on how he had been able to end up in that absurd situation and how he had even been able to suddenly end up inside that character's body, and although he still didn't know the reasons why it had suddenly happened to him, there was nothing he could do to find an answer to it, at least not yet. Even so, the protagonist was determined not to let the end of his life be that absurd thing in the game and would find a way to survive no matter what. Apart from that school, the academy was close enough to a city with all the Arkan Mountains surrounding it, and at the moment, Ed decided that he would go to a place that was far to the north of the academy, an undiscovered forest. He was trying to escape the proud eyes of the other students on him and ended up walking for half an entire day, enough time for him to understand the totally chaotic situation he had gotten himself into. At the point where Ed ended up being disowned by his family, it was precisely the beginning of a super extreme part of the scenario within the game. But fortunately, even after he was sent away like that, he wasn't entirely expelled from school yet, which was a really important detail to keep in mind. Because of that detail, and also because of the whole scenario involved, Sylvania Academy was one of the highest ranking academies in that society, and as long as he could graduate from it, he could guarantee himself a secure future. And since the game was usually set inside the academy, Ed thought he could use his intelligence as a gamer who had spent so much time playing to be able to use and enjoy that opportunity to the full which meant that if he just graduated normally without drawing any attention to himself as a real extra within that world, the protagonist might be able to acquire a better way of living comfortably in that world. Especially when he had left behind such a comfortable life in his previous world, and now he would need to regain his peace in that world within the game. So, obviously, Ed's big goal now would be his graduation, 
But the big problem was the lack of tuition fees after all, even though that semester of classes was paid for, he could still continue studying for a while longer at the college until the next semester. But even so, with that ridiculous status window that Ed had, at most he could pray to all the gods in an attempt to get a scholarship, but as that seemed too problematic to think about right now, Ed decided that he would worry about that later and first focus on the more urgent parts that he needed to think about. There were a few things that the protagonist needed to focus on in order to survive now, and among them was the need to get food, clothes, and a place to sleep. So he looked at the things he had with him, thinking that for the next week, maybe he could find a way to avoid becoming a real beggar living on the streets with those clothes that had no status, a ceremonial dagger with no status that he carried, and an ornamental cup that also had no status and only made him realize that he had nothing more than that but he still had enough clothes to pass the time. Still, there was the question of food and water that he would need to sort out, but he also didn't have a place to spend the night or anything to eat that night. And also considering Ed's reputation in that world, it would be very difficult to get a job, and he couldn't return to the dormitories after being kicked out like that one way or another. So it just left him with the resolution to stay stuck out there in the forest for a while until he found a new way or place to spend his time. Ed commented that at least he was relieved that there was some water nearby in the form of a stream. But there were still 10 days until the start of classes at the school, and until then, he would need to sort out all those problems so that he would be minimally prepared to attend. In the meantime, the protagonist decided to start practicing his use of wind magic, and was relieved that at least he could still use a few magical incantations, which was still pretty impressive, because he was totally exhausted even after just chopping a few small pieces of wood using magic, and it was all the fault of Ed's ridiculous status window and his horrible attribute points. Obviously, this only made the experience more difficult because with the effort he ended up getting even hungrier and more tired, which left him frustrated because he could at least have eaten something before he was sent away from the dormitory because using magic really made him tired and hungry from the huge expenditure of energy. With Ed getting quite hungry, he remembers something his grandfather said when he was young, about how when he was starving in the mountains, he said they used to eat pieces of wood in order to survive. This made the protagonist just try to use his fire magic to feed himself, thinking that it might be enough for him at least for the time being as long as it was edible and good enough to satisfy his hunger. Ed realized that if he didn't look too hard, those pieces of wood looked a bit like fresh chicken meat, but they still obviously tasted like crap, and three days later, the protagonist was cursing his grandfather for telling him those ridiculous stories. After surviving for a day or two on just that kind of food, Ed thought that in the end wood should only be used to build houses and nothing else. To start building, he would need to drive the pieces of wood into the ground to create support, but as he only had two hands, there was still a great deal of difficulty in putting all those supports in place by himself, not an easy job to do at all, especially with a ridiculously weak body like that. But with a great deal of effort and dedicated time, eventually the protagonist was able to complete at least his first task of making a small, almost insignificant shelter, but there was still a long way to go before he could be relieved. Besides, he couldn't sleep on the floor like that, and although it was a waste, he had no choice but to leave his clothes on the floor so that he could be at least a little more comfortable to sleep in. But eventually, some time later, he managed to make at least one join of wood that looked like a decent shelter to live in, even though he barely managed to finish it. But when he was finished, suddenly the system let him know that he had completed his first creation, and now his building skills had improved a little more unlocking the ability to create a new basic design of not even a star called a basic wooden shelter, where he could stay to rest for the time being, and would need constant maintenance to keep it up, especially as it would eventually become unusable over time. In addition, a survival skills detail window appeared for Ed, and he now had a novice builder rank, leaving the protagonist not at all thrilled even though it seemed that the building system was activating given his efforts. Originally, Ed lived as a nobleman, and he probably didn't even know that this sort of thing was supposed to exist in that world. 
but even so his skill with practicality was at the fourth level, which surprised him because it seemed that he was more skilled with his hands than with magic itself. And it was just now that he needed to be really practical when he was hungry and exhausted like that. So he also created with his hands a simple hunting spear that was created using a ceremonial dagger, which could be used for fishing or hunting, but which wasn't very sharp. The protagonist decided to go out and hunt for something decent to eat, especially as he had been on an empty stomach for two days and so his body was exhausted and totally low on energy, especially after working so hard to build a shelter. Ed knew he shouldn't be moving any more than he had to at this point, but he still didn't have much choice but to do something in order to survive, especially as he had reached a state of desperation far greater than just keeping him moving. He needed and wanted something to eat, more specifically meat. After hunting fish with hatred, Ed uses his fire-starting skills to roast those fish without even thinking twice, relieved that he could eat something. There was still a week until school started, and he just needed to hold out as long as he could until the day in question arrived, and he thought that if he could just keep surviving like that until the day came, he could go to school without too much trouble and still do his best to survive. But just when he was so busy surviving, he ended up forgetting something very important, and that something was the main characters in that game, and one of them had just appeared in front of him. But of all people, Ed really didn't expect to see her now and right in that forest, especially as this was Princess Phonia who had previously given him a real lecture and kicked him out of the academy with her bare hands, and Phonia was clearly annoyed that Ed hadn't left the academy for real yet. Ed Rothtaylor was originally a villain who appeared very early on in the game, and using his status as a member of the nobility, he appeared to beat up the protagonist's childhood friend only to receive a punishment in response for his actions. But his mischief didn't stop there, because with a heart full of revenge, Ed maliciously prepared to receive the protagonist's entry into the Sylvania Academy entrance exam, but ended up being caught by a girl who ended up in the Academy entrance exam and ended up discovering his identity while in hiding. That girl was Phonia Elias Kloll, the third princess of the Kloll Empire. Using her ability to discern, Phonia was able to detect the lies and conspiracies that Ed was using, and after being seen and caught in such a terrible state, screaming through his teeth and giving the biggest and most lame excuses in front of everyone, Phonia used her detection ability to be able to expose him and thus send him out of the academy dormitories. Everyone at the academy eventually began to hate Ed, and this obviously had to include Phonia, who was now demanding to know what exactly he was doing out there alone on academy grounds, and the protagonist was worried that he had ended up meeting someone he shouldn't have. Phonia continued to demand to know what he was doing there and asked if the academy had expelled him, and Ed replied that he was still a student there, but had just been thrown out of the dormitories, but Phonia ignores his words and tells him to leave because she couldn't allow herself to see such a disgraceful person like him walking around that school and would personally go to the academy department and personally ask for him to be expelled for the crime of committing a dishonorable act as a student of that academy, and for the crime of remaining a student just to block a possible better future for the students there by his actions. Ed was worried and sad because his food that was being cooked was starting to burn even after it had taken him so long to get it, and given that his food was burning even though he was in a state of survival, that life crisis was affecting him in many ways. But even so, Princess Phonia certainly had the necessary power to be able to expel the protagonist from the academy if she really wanted to, and if that was the case, Ed began to act as if he were threatening Phonia commenting that she really must be a fool to walk around alone so late when she was normally accompanied by guards and people to protect her from danger. But Phonia replies that if he was trying to threaten her and do anything against her just because he didn't have escorts then he would certainly regret it, but instead the protagonist says that what he was really trying to do was thank her. Phonia uses her ability to see through Ed's words and is shocked to see that there were no lies in his words, and the protagonist expected her to be like that. That's because the Rothtaylor family to which Ed belonged was famous and very influential, 
but using their name to exploit civilians and carry out experiments for immortality research was for the protagonists something that made that family truly evil and should be destroyed at all costs. So everyone in that family would eventually be imprisoned or even executed. But he was still disinherited, and although he was going cold and hungry now, it was better than dying, which only made his situation a little better than it could have been, and using that thought he should be able to convince Phonia without using any lies, or he would end up being expelled, and thus it would be a real game over for him. Looking at the timeline from when Ed ended up being expelled, it should now be about a week before classes at the academy start, but it was still strange for him to end up meeting Princess Phonia in those circumstances. The protagonist says that for her to appear there without any escort and in ordinary clothes must only mean that she was completing the class placement test, which was a test to find magic beads that were supposed to be scattered in the forest. Professor Glass's test was certainly known for being quite perverse, but given that the one taking the test was Princess Phonia, even the protagonist hoped that she was aiming to become the best student in the class, going straight to a class. Phonia asked if he was trying to flatter her in any way, and it just seemed that he hadn't changed at all, and as expected she should just go ahead with her idea of expelling him from the academy immediately. But the protagonist interrupted her by saying that without his help she would never be able to get into a class. Then he said that if he was lying, she could just expel him as she pleased, and Ed told her that if she followed the southwest side of the forest, there would be a small grassy island where a large tree would be in the middle of it. That tree was known as Merilda's Guardian Tree, and there she would be able to find the gift that Ed had left her, one of the beads she needed to pass the exam. The Ed of three days ago was certainly a liar and a charlatan and Phonia herself remembered it perfectly. But even so, the Ed she had recently met was totally different, which left her surprised and pensive. Finally, the class test was officially over, and the magic teacher Glast asked the students to present the beads they had picked up in the forest, immediately sending several students to class F, because it was important to take note of the intention of the test from the start. And that test wasn't just about how to find the magic bead itself, and so Glast stated that those who found the beads with magical power would be the ones to be sent to class A, and there were only three of that type scattered around that were found. The students who found them were Zix, Loretal, and finally, the one who was able to find the last bead under the tree that had great magic in it, Phonia, who would become the best student in the class. At this point, the scene cuts to the protagonist realizing that his fish have been totally burnt and he doesn't even have the strength to hunt again, so he decides to create a generic fishing rod so that he can catch some new fish. He thinks about how the third Phoenician princess, from a young age, was able to see through all the flattery and sophistication and despite the critical and serious view she took when she discovered that people could lie to her and it was thanks to the notion of that new reality that she awakened that new innate power of hers, one that people could never escape, which was reading and analyzing another person's intentions through their eyes. And so people never had a choice but to give her true and authentic information. But that also led to another big problem. The reason why Princess Phonia, as proud as she was, wanted to and would become the well-known Princess of Love after facing the failure of passing the class test originally, she would end up becoming Class F for failing the test, and thus a major change would occur. Still, if Fionia, who normally had a big influence on all the scenarios, found the golden bead and entered Class A, the original scenario of the story would change and collapse. And even if Ed himself ended up avoiding expulsion, all the information he had from the original story would go down the drain because the story would change, and soon his knowledge would be useless. But he still decided to help her because he knew of the existence of the one who would originally be at the top of the class, the one known as Lucy Merrill. Possibly, the future hadn't changed completely yet and Phonia was still able to see the truth through everything, and in the end she was able to find the bead just as the protagonist had said without lying, but it still certainly wasn't a gift for her.
the protagonist was confused as to why Phonia had concealed her identity in the first place, especially as she seemed embarrassed to receive special treatment if it was revealed who she really was and it seemed that she actually wanted to prove herself in front of all the other students rather than receive a gift just for her origins. Phonia just wanted to be seen as someone who was able to receive the best results in that entrance test for the Magic Academy by her own efforts, but in the end she originally wasn't able to do that and so she ended up not achieving her original goal of being recognized as one of the A class students. And so, the title of Princess of Love that she would receive in the future was not because she had a skill or status that made her worthy of that name, but because she had walked a very rigorous path and so ended up receiving that new title. That said, the protagonist decided to play a bait and switch game in order to attract Phonia, and whether it was true or not wouldn't change much in the end, as the princess would always be able to discern what was true or not. And so, even if Ed Roth Taylor had really believed that the princess would fail the test, she had built up enough confidence and faced her difficulties head-on to achieve her goal and was ready to rub it in the protagonist's face that she had won and passed the test, even if he didn't believe her. Even so, Ed ended up not lying to Phonia about not being able to get into Class A, and so she was able to find the bead and got into the class as she had wished, which made her want to keep an eye on the protagonist from then on, still frustrated at having received his help for some reason. In parallel, Ed could just carry on living in a place like that which was in the middle of a forest and inside a shelter made in a totally clumsy way, but he would still need to use his time to be able to run quite early in the morning so that he could get to his high school classes on time. But even so, in the end, he was finally able to return to Sylvania Academy. And so, he meets up with the other students for the school's entrance ceremony that was about to begin, and all the students begin to be welcomed, listening to the speech that it was always good to see that the old students had made a lot of progress throughout that new semester, and especially now that they were about to start a new school semester. The speaker said that they could all stop and enjoy the food while they listened to his words, but while the speech was going on, Ed could hear the rumors of the students looking at him funny and commenting on how he ended up surviving even after the shame he went through a week and a few days ago, which only made them gossip about how they couldn't even imagine what courage he had to show up like that at the school's opening ceremony even after everything he'd done and wonder if he really intended to continue studying there. Still, this was a great victory for someone like him who had worked so hard and so the protagonist just decided to enjoy eating freely and very slowly, even though he was devouring a gigantic amount of plates of food without a second thought, especially since his big goal there was to get to graduation. Meanwhile, some of the girls comment on Ed, who was the second-year boy who made all that fuss about apologizing during the entrance exam, and yet they comment that he seemed a bit different compared to how he acted in the past, eating politely. They commented that they had heard that those desserts were made by great chefs and wanted to take the opportunity to eat together and also enjoy a good chat about what they had done during the vacations. But among the girls there was one who felt that Ed was a totally different person and was looking intently at the protagonist who was just hoping to be able to graduate from that school without anything much happening and just being able to enjoy his life peacefully. And so time passed until the arrival of the first day of school at Sylvania, and soon a new speech began to be made about how this was a new semester, and everyone should certainly be excited to see the new uniform that would be used at the school so that everyone could get it and wear it, and to see how well they would be trying that year so that they could do well in Sylvania's academic society, they would be trying to cheer up everyone's mood. But that was actually the complete opposite in the case of our protagonist, because after all, on the very first day of school, he almost ended up being expelled, because he hadn't even imagined that Phonia would actually tell Dean about his presence at the academy. Still, considering the super weird way old Dean kept smiling at him all that time, Ed thought that it didn't look like Phonia had told Dean anything bad about him after all. Still, he had merely been able to avoid that expulsion, and so he just needed to be even more careful from then on so that nothing worse than that would happen, especially as he could then try to avoid the ending that would normally occur in that world originally for his character who was just a third-rate villain.
By now, Ed's survival skills had improved considerably, and he was now considered a novice fighter with archery as his specialty, although he was still at level 1. In addition to his survival skills, the protagonist would also need to keep up his magic training in a way appropriate for a magic college student and to maintain the best combination of both activities, there was nothing better for someone like him than the use of the bow and arrow. As his survival skills became more efficient and he was now able to create good quality arrows, he should be able to make magic formulas or even use spirits to shoot his arrows. Still, magic formulas with spirits were a little beyond his realm of talent, but just as he was training he ended up meeting a top student from the second year class, and coincidentally a genius at using spirits, Janica Failover. Janica asks if he's the interesting guy Marolda was mentioning a while ago, and approaches him to confirm that he is Ed, clearly interested in him in some way, although the protagonist is surprised that she approached him so quickly. Janica asks him if he was so surprised that she knew him, and he explains that that forest was all Merilda's territory, the Great Spirit, and that's why he'd heard a lot about Ed from Merilda, which leaves the protagonist surprised that the forest master was suddenly saying all those things about him. Janica tells him that Merilda was a bit noisy, and with her attention being on every corner of the forest, she would obviously know if there were any unexpected visitors, which makes the protagonist a bit nervous, especially when he realizes that he had killed several rabbits and also cut down several trees, which could have been interpreted as something bad by the forest spirit. But Janica says that he shouldn't worry about something so small because it was natural for forest creatures to hunt and kill each other in order to survive, and explains that Merilda wouldn't be that bothered by something as simple as that. Ed says that Merilda would probably have to have a big heart full of compassion to think like that, which makes Janica laugh before mentioning that there was something she wanted to show him, and then shows him a lovely little spirit that she had made a contract with the day before just as she saw it, and asks if he would like to touch it. Ed thinks that if he were to become friends with Janica, he would just have to break off his ties with her at the right time, but instead he replies that he can't see spirits, leaving Janica surprised to hear this, and he just agrees, turning to leave and telling her that he only went there to get food and would be leaving now. He thought that just by following the original story he could gain some information that would give him a certain advantage and Janica, someone who was of great importance to the original story, was someone he should certainly never get close to. At this, Janica comments to Merilda that it was just as she had mentioned before and Ed really was a fascinating person, and no matter how much she thought about it, she thought that in fact the protagonist really wasn't able to see spirits, which only makes her more interested, but she is still hurt that she only tried to make friends and be kind to him, only to receive an ungracious answer like that. Still, she sighs, thinking that it wasn't as if they were likely to see each other again, and could only think of something else for the time being. The distance between Ed's shelter and the student area wasn't short, and he barely had time to get to school early in the mornings by rushing at full speed when he left, and just considering that he was making that commute and making him so tired first thing in the morning was a bit ridiculous to do considering his super excellent statuses. The protagonist thought that if he really wanted to receive the scholarship to be able to pay for his studies from then on, he would have to work hard to study as diligently as possible. So he wrote his subjects on a rock using a burnt stick and borrowed books from the student library to be able to secure his subjects. On his way home, Ed would wash his sweaty clothes that he wore every day. But even after doing all that, he still needed to check that he had enough firewood to get him through the night as well as drinking water and preparing snacks to eat during the day and the next day too. He could only sleep for about four hours because of all the effort he put in during the day, but that wasn't what bothered him most after all, Janica had been watching him the whole time, so he asked her openly how long she planned to follow him around like that. Janica is shocked that the protagonist has found out, and he replies that it would be absurd for him not to notice because after all, he was the great Ed Roth Taylor, the worst hooligan in the school, and so he asks her what exactly she wanted with him to keep stalking him like that all day long, and Janica replies that it was only because other people were always judging him like that, 
but she herself didn't know him well enough yet to say whether or not he was that kind of person. Ed thinks that Janica was exactly that kind of character who might have seemed silly or innocent from the outside, but in fact she was quite strong-minded and independent, but despite all that, knowing how she would end up in the future of that game in the original story, he just couldn't answer her with a simple smile in his mind. That's because Janica was the final boss of the first act of the game he was trapped in, and knowing that she was just a character who smiled at him, Ed needed to keep in mind that he was one of the villains in the story too, and therefore needed to act like one to keep her far away from him, and although he didn't want to go that far just for that, he then asked her if she couldn't do him a favor now that fate had brought them together like that so they could talk. Janica gets excited and asks what kind of favor exactly he wanted from her, and then he says that just as she should see, he was in a real mess and had just been sent away from his family, and on top of that he was pretty tight in every possible way, and asks if she couldn't give him some money. Ed commented that it wasn't as if he wasn't going to give the money back and obviously that was the sort of thing friends were meant to be for, and he would just be lending it for a while, and asked how much money exactly she had. The protagonist knew that every year Janneker received a scholarship as the top student in her class, but that didn't just justify her excellence, because behind it all she was so poor that she could barely get by without the scholarship and couldn't even go on to graduate from high school without it if she didn't depend on it. As a daughter of a small ranch, Janica's greatest weakness was her money, and this became clear when she apologized, and with that the protagonist thinks he has finally managed to keep Janica away from him. So, three days later, Ed still felt that things weren't going too well for him, but he didn't want to have to get involved with any more flashy or problematic characters that were related to the main story, and so he would just be very careful from then on, so that the story wouldn't be heading straight for the original version. But when the protagonist arrives at his shelter, he is surprised to see something. In terms of importance, the character he ended up finding in front of him in his shelter had just as heavy and important a presence as Janica, being the great prodigy target of his classmates and even teachers, being a great rare genius and the most powerful character in the entire game of Sylvania's flawed swordsman, Lucy Merrill. And suddenly Lucy simply appeared inside his shelter asleep, which left the protagonist at a loss to understand anything, and he wondered what exactly had happened for her to appear there on the mountain in that valley, and taking the main story into consideration, he was careful to interact with her. Lucy says that Ed was being so noisy that he could hardly sleep, and she asks what exactly he did, but she tells him that it wasn't him who was noisy, but the big wolf behind him that was right next to the shelter that just kept talking to him all that time. The protagonist turns to Merilda's wolf spirit, who says it was time for her to ask him something, and that something, according to Lucy, was that the spirit wanted Ed to save Janica's life at any cost. Lucy had only been in that camp for two days, and he hoped that it wouldn't cause a major change in the main story, although it took Ed a while to realize how complicated things would end up being in the future. Then suddenly, he received a quest to join the joint combat training, which was literally nothing more than an exercise in hand-to-hand -hand combat and to minimize lethality as much as possible. The student combatants were only supposed to use fake weapons. Among the participants were the Princess Phonia, the Golden Daughter Lortel, the Spirit User Janica, the Lazy Lucy, the Evil Clebius, and many others whom the protagonist could only go on naming endlessly. However, the most important of all was the protagonist himself, the Fallen Swordsman Taylor. The protagonist was excitedly watching the hand-to-hand -hand training, especially curious to be able to see Taylor in action, and he himself already knew the results so he didn't even pay much attention to the previous fights because the winners of the duels in the joint training combat were only first-timers, the same as the protagonist Taylor. Still, there was one person as an exception, and that was Janica who until now had continued to take up Ed's time in one way or another just to get his attention. The protagonist still couldn't believe that Janica was still running around all happy even after the pathetic experience when he asked her for money a few days ago, but unlike Lucy, who was like a family cat who just showed up and did whatever she wanted, Janica was like a family dog who was always chasing people around, 
Janica offers the protagonist to see the list of participants in the competition, and he ends up turning her down saying he wasn't interested, and she asks him if he wasn't interested in his own match, which leaves Ed confused because he didn't even know he was having to get involved in a battle either until that moment. That's because in the original story, Ed had been expelled from school, but now things were different and he had to take part, which made him nervous about who exactly he would be fighting, but before he could even see who exactly he would be fighting, Taylor's presence caught Ed's attention, and he thought that at the moment, it didn't matter who he was really fighting. He needed to pay close attention to Taylor because even though this was a world that could only be seen through screens, he had lived in Taylor's shoes for a long time as a player, and from the miserable and vain unhappy endings to the true endings that gave long-term impressions and truly marked him, the protagonist himself had been able to fulfill the endings several times. And among the countless routes within the game, there wasn't a single route that wasn't specifically difficult and arduous to get through, and he himself had decided to take charge of his own life from then on, but he still wanted to be rooting for Taylor so that he would at least be able to overcome his own challenges. But even so, just then, the voice making the announcements began to call Lucy's attention. She was supposed to be a student who was going to take part in the training, and she was supposed to prepare herself so that she could enter the battle arena and do her training, which left Ed shocked and worried as to where exactly Lucy had ended up. People complained because as usual Lucy was always asleep, and she should at least try to finish her duel before thinking about resting at any moment. So, the battle would be between first year and top of the class Lucy against Taylor McClure the true protagonist of that game world, born to be a great swordsman who never ended up holding a sword before in his life. Yet when he carried a sword for the first time he was able to cut through Lucy's lightning-fast magic. That was a spell she had obviously done in order to win, but even so her magic was overcome, and she ended up being outmaneuvered, causing Taylor to catch her with his guard down, and he was able to cut the distance towards her. Surprised, Lucy would attack him with her light magic again, using an intermediate level magic and Taylor would end up completely receiving that powerful magic attack, but Lucy would still end up being disqualified for using an intermediate level magic, making Taylor have the honor of being the first to beat Lucy. That was a classic and legendary scene in the game that even thrilled the protagonist just by remembering it. So as soon as the battle began Ed himself was super excited to see it happening in front of his eyes. Taylor lunges at Lucy, but Taylor is simply knocked down with a single blow that leaves everyone totally shocked and unable to understand anything that has happened, and not even Lucy thought twice or was surprised to beat Taylor like that. The students comment in shock that the battle was over in the literal blink of an eye and also that one would never expect someone to be able to beat the top of the class. But it was still strange that Taylor had run towards a long-distance mage like Lucy as if it was nothing like that. Taylor's path in life was full of challenges after all, he was a redneck foreigner and a real failure as a student, a real failure who hadn't even had a single markdown since he had entered that school and a failure that was not recognized by anyone. While everyone was still jumping to conclusions about the end of that duel, in a situation where he was put against the wall and it looked like he was going to lose, even amidst the greatest despair in the world, Taylor never lost hope and Ed was mentally rooting for him with all his might. Taylor lunged at Lucy, making the protagonist think that Lucy should now use her light magic when her guard was down as she was surprised by Taylor's return, but Ed himself was surprised to see that Taylor's attack ended up being countered not by light magic but by an absurdly powerful wind magic that sent Taylor literally flying, making him hit his head on the wall far away as he flew past the protagonist, who was still in total shock at what he had just witnessed. And so, victory in the duel went to Lucy, and while everyone celebrated, Ed was still amazed that Taylor had lost the battle so cruelly. Ed realizes that this really was a huge problem because they certainly couldn't leave Taylor alone like that. But he still reflects on the magic used by Lucy, which was known as the wind shield used by a spirit that would protect her from sudden attacks. That was a magic that could only be used by making a contract with a wind spirit, more specifically with Merilda, 
but according to the game, Merelda and Lucy were originally two separate entities. And with Lucy spending some time by his side, she ended up making a contract with Merelda and became stronger because of it. But just as Ed was trying to go after Taylor, it was suddenly announced that the battle between Ed and Princess Phonia was going to take place, but the protagonist ignored all that completely and started running after Taylor desperately, thinking that Taylor needed to win anyway. And in order to do that, he needed to pick up his sword again and regain his confidence, but even so, in the end he ended up losing entirely through Ed's fault due to his involvement with the Academy. The protagonist ran after Taylor thinking that he didn't know if it would mean anything, but he at least wanted to try and do something to make things better for him. Ed arrives shouting at Taylor that his efforts were really great and he shouldn't feel bad because there was nothing to be embarrassed about, and the protagonist just thought that if Taylor's heart was broken because he had lost, there was still a chance that he would be forced to try even harder in the end to avoid him ending up in serious trouble. Ed tells Taylor to keep his great pride because he really did do very well and it was just Lucy's problem that she was an opponent who wasn't a good sort to face and so he shouldn't get upset about it and Ed was determined to find a way to make Taylor regain his animosity, especially as the one who should be in the spotlight at the academy was Taylor, not Ed. The scene cuts to when Phonia had received the blessing of a god, and the first person to discover her innate ability was Emperor Klol himself. Phoenix's ability wasn't actually something given by a god, but rather something innate that came about because life in royalty was full of intrigue and conspiracies and so, from within the dark abyss, she developed that sense of self in order to be able to protect herself from other people, which was why Fionia was always confident of her own ability. There was still a great and grotesque chasm in her eyes involving the way the imperial family looked at her, and even though she was a member of the royal family, the princess of love lived as if it didn't matter, and she really pretended not to know. When the protagonist returns to face Phonia, he asks her to go easy on him, but even so Phonia felt she had no choice but to look directly at Ed even now, and Phonia herself tells him to go easy on her during the battle. The students start commenting to each other about how a while ago Ed had been shouting alone in the corridors to Taylor and Ed had seemed really persistent, which made the other students comment that it just seemed like the protagonist was trying to get attention or else be the funny one by trying to look like he could do something when he himself was a big incompetent with nothing to add. The students mock Ed because he probably just wanted to seem like a nice guy by cheering on someone who had lost and laugh because it was all quite ridiculous to watch, almost as if Ed was the kind of person who wouldn't change even after receiving several punishments to learn how he should really act in front of other people. The protagonist thinks that the students were actually all right because Ed Roth Taylor initially used his position to embarrass the younger students and when he realized that things didn't go according to plan, he was caught tampering with the results of the exam tests, causing him to be seen as a real embarrassment among the other students. At least Ed had certainly been that kind of person in the past, but now Phonia herself couldn't believe that the Ed standing in front of her was the same person she had seen before. Before, Ed's desperate action to try and help Taylor was totally real, and she could almost doubt his ability to see the truth and the lie in people, but still, they would need to face each other in the sword duel now, and soon the combat between them begins. Phonia began by saying that Ed was a person who was always confusing her, and she wanted to come to some conclusion about what kind of person he really was during that duel. And so she began to prepare herself so that she could attack him with a water spell, knowing that the protagonist could only use wind and fire spells, and so she was curious to know how exactly Ed intended to react to her attack. Phonia thought that to be able to make a big impression using a few flashy moves, especially in a final dramatic battle like that, hitting the mysterious man who just left her confused whenever they met might be enough to make her calm down. But to Phonia's surprise, the protagonist doesn't even move and receives her attack straight on, rolling away and claiming he's lost, which leaves Phonia shocked because Ed clearly didn't block her blow even after he clearly noticed her water sphere that she had thrown. 
the students start laughing at the protagonist's face because he was really stupid to take a blow like that and even after just acting like a super cool guy and thinking he was useful, in the end he was defeated with just a single move, and everyone starts praising Princess Fionia for her actions, which were really good to see after everyone had been frustrated by Ed's actions and exaggerated words a while before. But Ed just accepts his defeat and thanks Fionia because it was a good fight and he was able to learn a lot from it, which only makes her more frustrated because he clearly didn't even do anything to defend himself, and come to think of it, since he entered the battlefield, he hasn't made eye contact with Fionia at any point since. So it's only announced that Fionia has won the battle quickly and everyone celebrates, leaving the princess shocked because it seemed that Ed didn't really even have an interest in winning the duel in the first place. The protagonist wasn't even worried about a duel like that and thought that when he came into contact with Princess Fionia, he should be very careful because otherwise he could only end up damaging the original scenario within the game even more especially since that particular princess was one of the main characters. But even so, the person who was even more important than Fionia was the protagonist Taylor, and as soon as it was all over, Ed started running around looking for him, but soon ended up being interrupted by Fionia who had chased him, leaving him surprised to know what exactly she wanted by going off like that without her escorts again. But Fionia was dying of rage and shouted at the protagonist to find out what exactly he was thinking. But even though the protagonist tried to explain why he thought the problem was the duel, the princess was still annoyed because Ed had been making ridiculous excuses from the start, and she couldn't even beat him because after all Ed didn't even try to win and obviously he just ran off as quickly as possible from the battlefield without caring a bit about the results. Fionia complains because she always had trouble making an effort in class, especially with the foxy-faced merchant who always took advantage of other people's opportunities to get along, with Professor Glass who was always rude and didn't get along with her at all, and all the servants were always bothering her with royal stuff that made her crazy with rage. Fionia screamed that she was angry because she had enough on her mind, but Ed still managed to make her even angrier by acting like that and making things more complicated, which surprised the protagonist because he really didn't imagine that she was going through such frustration on her own. So Ed tells her to take a deep breath and calm down a bit because there was no need for her to get so worked up like that, and so after helping her to take a deep breath and calm down, Fionia ends up being embarrassed by her outburst and tells him to just forget about what she's just done. That said, the protagonist just agrees and starts to walk away wanting to leave at once, but Fionia mentions that she really had a bad habit of just asking broad questions, and yet she felt like she was constantly trying to predict what other people would always be trying to say to her or about her, and that was probably because she had lived too long in the palace. But Ed wasn't at all interested in her sad flashback because he just wanted to leave at once because he needed to find Taylor as soon as possible. So Fonia just keeps talking and says that she would talk to him openly, and asks him if he really tried to cut his ties with his family because he knew about the dark side of his family and Ed probably just needed a reason to be kicked out and so he acted like that on purpose, especially by getting close to Taylor so that he would be even more left out. The protagonist thinks that was a pretty straightforward deduction. And although much of her deduction was wrong, the protagonist thinks it was still true that the Rothstaler family had a dark side. But Ed replies that he didn't know what she was talking about, thinking that it was too early for her to find out and Fionia should wait for the right moment to figure out the game's plots, which makes Fionia angry again because she knew she was right to think logically and asks what exactly he was after by suddenly getting involved with Taylor. She asks directly why Ed was cheering and supporting a person as if he was trying to get kicked out, especially since Ed was originally supposed to hate Taylor to begin with. The protagonist realizes that Fonia was still asking him very harsh questions and replies without much thought that it was only because he liked to take the piss out of Taylor, outright lying that since everyone hated him he just thought that if he cheered for Taylor, people would see him differently or something. But Fonia is outraged that he was clearly lying, and orders him to look her in the eye to tell her the truth once and for all. But as Ed was dodging the issue all the time, 
the protagonist only made Phonia even angrier because she obviously didn't have any evidence to back up her words even though she knew the protagonist was lying. Despite Phonia's great anger, Ed was trying his best to stick to the original storyline to avoid major changes in the story, so Phonia sighs and says she won't say anything more until she has evidence and tells him he can leave at once, telling him he should start looking for the front door because he must have something important to deal with now. Ed walked past her thanking her, thinking that this was the first time Fionia had shown that kind side of her. And for someone who was going to seriously affect the main scene of the game, the fact that she was involved with so many people and events was problematic enough to give him a headache with worry. Still, Ed knew it was his fault because new additions were happening within the game, so he sighed wondering how he could compare the weight of his responsibilities with those of a princess, and although it was a bit out of the curve, he told Fionia that she looked really exhausted and should pay a bit more attention to herself, even though he knew it was just as important to keep up his studies too. Ed told her that this place wasn't the royal palace where she had to worry about every little thing, but Sylvania Academy. The protagonist's words end up touching Fionia because normally, she has always spent her whole life trying to see through other people's words, but that was the first time someone's words saw through her. The protagonist keeps running because he realizes that he's wasted too much time talking to Fionia and thinks that if Taylor quits the academy so quickly, his comfortable life would be ruined, or rather, the whole world could really end. Ed finally finds Taylor and rushes over, not knowing exactly what to say when suddenly a girl shouts at Ed not to come any closer, and that girl says that Ed shouldn't dare bother Taylor any further. That girl was Ayla Triss, another of the game's main protagonists who was now making her debut in the game.